Ah, so good. So good. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're it. happy. Ah, uh, yeah. Hey everyone, and welcome to the How to Film Weddings podcast, episode number 17. I am John Bunn, your host, live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Nick is out today, but I am so excited for our interview. I just interviewed Patrick Moreau from Muse Storytelling, and if you don't know this guy, he is basically the godfather when it comes to storytelling. This guy, I came across him 10 years ago. A friend of mine was like, you've got to check out this company, Still Motion. They were blowing my mind with the way that they they told stories, the way that they built these characters around stories when it came to weddings, and they were blowing up. They've gone all over the world. They filmed at the Super Bowl. They filmed for Canon. They're working with Four Seasons. They filmed for Apple and the United Nations. They've done it all. He's won Emmys. Ah, I'm so excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Let's jump in to the How to Film Weddings podcast, episode 17 with Patrick Moreau. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick, um, for joining us today. And we're really excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. To start with, I just want to like I found you. My buddy Joel, whenever I was first getting into weddings, was like, dude, you've got to check out this still motion. You've got to check out this guy, Patrick. These are these tutorials. You know, at the time I was on these big rig cameras. I mean, it was right after the DSLR. And I mean, like, I just remember sitting down in like my computer at home on YouTube and just being like, holy crap, I suck at my job. This is mind blowing. I just remember like very kind my of whole world <laughs> yeah, just being completely rocked. Like I watched everything that you guys did, everything. I mean, immediately, like it was like this drug. I just had to like watch more and more. And like, so to start with, thank you. I mean, I immediately got better. My job is, I mean, like the way that I do what I do is so much better. So thank you so much for what you do for our industry. I would love to kind of hear kind of that story of how that got going, just kind of from, you know, you picking up a camera, figuring out you like it. Um, tell us how that got going um, and how still motion got going and kind of where that took you. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think I would start with the idea that I have always approached my filmmaking career with the perspective that like, what would I do if this was the last shoot I ever had? This is the last thing of my career. Like, how would I approach it? And that very much like, don't leave anything on the table. Um, and, you know, I, I started as a psych student. I wasn't even really into the filmmaking thing. That was just to explore what I was learning in psychology. Uh, and so as we dove into weddings, it was actually about people. It wasn't, you know, <laughs> there was no desire to be a wedding filmmaker. It was, yeah. you know, to explore people. Uh, and then a wedding got noticed by um, Canon Camera and turned into a national commercial. I was like a third year university student sitting in this big conference room in Canada with all these executives who are actually talking about their original idea was they wanted us to direct a fake wedding to turn that into a commercial. And then they were looking at the budgets and the whole thing and they're like, wait a minute, let's just license your footage. Uh, yeah. And so they actually used um, Amy and Alex, a wedding we had shot and turned it into a national commercial. Um, you know, it, just mind blowing, you know, and that that was the first thing that kind of showed me what was possible when you tell a, a story well and you create content at a high level. Yeah. And I can remember walking into Best Buy being early 20s and 100 LCD like televisions start showing my wedding. Like, and it just yeah. like goosebumps. It's like now I get goosebumps <laughs> thinking about it, you know? Because um, it did play on like Grey's Anatomy and House, like primetime TV for the, I think it was the T2i at the time. Um, so yeah. that started the relationship with Canon, and then uh, they shipped us a prototype 7D, shot a wedding with that, uh, and it ended up going viral, hundreds of thousands of views. One of the people that saw it was from the National Football League. What the hell the National Football League was doing creeping, yeah. you know, our Vimeo channel, I've, I'll, I'll never know. But they could called out of the blue um and I'm, I'm sure you guys are super familiar with ray roman you know he's a, an iconic figure in the industry but i got a call from the nfl and i i thought it was ray roman because you know he <laughs> would play tricks like that and we would joke around yes, he would. and yes, i thought he would. so like i answered the phone and they're like hi this is the nfl we went and like, okay <laughs> come on right and like i didn't know what to say and it's exactly like you see in the movies no idea what to say um and I, I, they actually said we like how you tell stories and we want to see how that would fit with our game. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> so and we flew game, down. We, the game being the Super Bowl game. Right? Uh, we I mean, started with the playoffs. 
the playoffs. He started with the playoffs. Right. Okay. Um, that one shoot turned into a 200-day contract. Still as a mm-hmm. university student, still as a wedding filmmaker, 200-day contract shooting everything for the NFL. And somebody from CBS, the television network, is looking for people to make a documentary on the Army-Navy football game. So they see the work we're doing with the NFL. Same thing. Yeah. Phone call out of the blue. We get sent to Quantico, Virginia, an area that's blurred out by Google Maps, like driven out in the back of a Humvee tracking Army cadets, you know, just like Army and Navy cadets and following them. Um, That landed me the director of photography uh, role on that documentary. uh, And then that went on to win a bunch of Emmys. And so it was, you know, psych student to like, let's let's do this as a hobby. Um, But, you know, I started with the idea that like it was never leaving anything on the table. And that was always the difference in why these things were going viral and why these opportunities, because it was just pushing so hard and not seeing boundaries where a lot of people normally do. Um, mm-hmm. And so it just, it changed everything. All of a sudden, AT&T and Apple and, you know, all these big companies were calling and we became the the team of people that if you wanted to, um, if you had real people and you wanted an authentic story, uh, that we were the ones you'd call. So we'd work with the best golfers in the world and athletes and all kinds of people like that. And everything changed. You know, it was just um, a whirlwind. Yeah. And I mean, what, how long was that from Amy and Alex, the wedding to the Emmy? Like how, what, how long was that? Probably less than five years. I remember yeah. it just being so fast, like, oh my goodness, these it wedding was, people. And then it's like, oh yeah. my goodness, they're doing the Super Bowl, or the, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's Army and Navy. And then it was just yeah. like, there they are. I mean, the Emmy's sitting behind you right now on your, I mean, it's like, it was, it was, so, it was crazy. Yes. And, and year was, after year, it's, I don't, I don't what know. What's really <laughs> cool about it, yeah, I mean, is that like the way that you even told stories, like you did the tutorials for Canon and different things. I remember, you know, as a college, you know, I had a business degree. I, I was, I picked up a camera and was working at a church and like filming and doing different things. And like just the way that you communicated, the way that you taught, you used story and it helped immediately connect those dots. I mean, story, yeah. you know, the ancient form has been the way we've communicated since the Bible. You know, I mean, it's like, that's what we did in story. And I mean, I think that a lot of people, you know, especially our listeners in the, in the wedding industry, it's more about the gear or it's more about the thing or the drone or the gimbal or, um, Mm -hmm. and you know, we know that story, if, if you have story, you can shoot it on an iPhone, you can shoot it you know, with a handy cam, but, um, I want to jump in. I mean, I really want the listeners to, to really, um, hear from you about like what it means, what story means to you. Like, what were you, especially in the wedding days? Like, what did that mean? Like, how were you going about figuring out what the story was? Were you showing up on a wedding day or were you, what, what did that look like for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, as we dive into this, the one thing that I I really want to say to everybody listening is that it can be easy, you know, to dismiss the idea of story in weddings. Some people Mm -hmm. think it's, you know, it's a it's not as important or, you know, I'm booking weddings and I don't really do that. And it, it totally works for me. And the biggest thing that I always try and go back to is like when you tell a great story, it can take you anywhere. Like it was not that our weddings were so beautiful that the NFL hired us or that we won Emmys or that, you know, a wedding led to several hundred thousand dollars in one commercial gig. It was absolutely the story, you know, so like learning that craft and learning how to communicate in that way. I mean, it, it, it takes you anywhere you want to go. Um, I didn't know it as that. When I, you know, when we started and we were working on weddings and everything else, like I, I definitely didn't know story anywhere to the degree that I know it, you know, now a decade later. What we knew then was that it was about people. What we knew at the beginning was that the wedding was a backdrop. Don't make it about the wedding, make it about the people. And the, the, the challenge I always had with the industry when this was, you know, our full time gig in weddings, um, was that people were very, the, 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 brides and grooms, the couples in the weddings were very homogenous. You didn't know who they were. Like there was no actual person personality and most people would approach the, the wedding the exact same way, whether it was this couple or that couple. And that to me was the tragedy. 
Like the way you shoot it, the tools, the lenses, the light should be inspired by the people. Like that should be your entryway into making something unique. And and that's, you know, um, that's creating a unique piece of art for these people. Uh, So that's that's where it started was really getting to know people, taking them out and just not talking about the wedding, you know, getting to know who they were and the little things that they talked about and joked about and whatever else. And we would use that as our beginning the early parts of story and and really celebrating their character you know and what makes them different and that's what caught on very early on was a, definitely a strong approach to cinematography but having something about these people in everything that we did that made them also very unique mm-hmm. so uh, definitely like I, I i have jumped on that super early in our our filmmaking storytelling i mean you know and I, I've heard you say it a couple of times, just like no boundaries, like you, you're, you, you didn't let the homogenistic, I mean, you didn't let them just be the groom and the bride and that's it. And it's like, I remember watching films where like the story might have been about the dog or the story might have been about a book. I mean, you found these characters um, and I remember you teaching and different things, but um, I want to talk about the boundaries because I feel like. Uh, like most of the people listening, this is what we, you know, we either have a job and this is, we're shooting 10 or 15 of these on the side, or like we've dove in full time to weddings or we shoot weddings and some commercial work, um, boundaries. I feel like I get in a rut a lot of the times if I'm shooting more than 20 or so weddings in a year where it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just, it's, you're cranking them out, you're doing it and it becomes this thing where you're burning out and the, the, the boundaries thing. I mean, I feel like, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you broke those boundaries. Did you take the, you know, take your brides and grooms, you know, did you, how did you get to know them beforehand? What was, you know, what was your process of like figuring out what made them tick? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the question we would always ask, um, was what's your favorite cookie? That was our that was our opener because <laughs> it had nothing to do with budget or wedding party or colors or venues or dates, um, and it actually tells you a lot about a person. Yeah. You know how short their answer is, how they answer, um, and and it creates a different experience from the get go. You know, so it's like, what was your favorite cookie? We asked them what they like to do on Sunday, um, and these questions that were very different. Uh, and I can tell you, I, I can remember talking to a bride in Maui and. Uh, talking about her wedding and asking her these questions and she didn't get it. Like, what do, what do you mean? Are we having cookies at the wedding? Wait, the, the wedding's not on Sunday. Like, why what, Why do you want to know this? And I'd be just like, no, no, I just want to know you because that informs and inspires how we might approach your story. And I'm right. telling you, three, four times before she's like, oh, like you actually just like, like, uh, oh, and it was this big epiphany. And I'll never forget what she said to me right after that. She was like, I never got it and I had such a hard time understanding what you were asking because everybody else I've talked to just treated me like cattle. They just wanted to know when my wedding date was, what my budget was and to get me to sign and get me out. So it was so bizarre that you actually cared about me. Um, So that offers a lot of insight. That's how we started. It wasn't about anything but who they were. Uh, And then I think we also realized very early on that when you establish trust and a real relationship, that so many of the boundaries are just, they're up here. They're in our own head. Mm -hmm. You know, like we think if you actually analyze, you know, and especially if you're young in your career and you look at how you approach a wedding, 99% of the shit you do is because you think you have to do it. Yeah, but, so true. But but who's actually telling you you have to do it? And, And what happened was when we realized that it was all in our head and we stopped doing it, the police didn't show up at our door the next morning, you know, like we, we actually and people were happy um, to the level that like we had a wedding film that didn't show the ceremony. Why? Because it didn't matter to the bride and groom. Like it just yeah. wasn't important to them. So we focused on like their RV and this broken down RV that he was going to use to pick her up in the morning. And that was the storyline, yeah. you know, and so it was just all of a sudden going, wait a minute, what do these people care about? How do we uniquely kind of get to know them? Um, and then we stopped trying to get approval from them. You know, like mm-hmm. early on, it would be like shot lists and like, let's talk about when we're showing up and what we're doing and like all of that kind of junk, like where it's like, we're going to align on how we're approaching this. And then as it became more about a relationship, we could show up when we wanted and we yeah. would leave when we wanted. And there would never be a, what are you going to do? How many, like, 
man, did I hate having conversations about how many cameras and yeah. quality and like who's doing what and are you covering this and a shot list and suggesting a soundtrack? Like, are you <laughs> like who walks into an art gallery and gets an artist and says, here, I want you to use this brush and use red and yellow. Like, it's silly, right? Um, so working out of that breaking those boundaries and going, wait a minute, we get away from this if we develop real relationships and we approach it like an art. We approach it like the painter with the canvas as opposed to the contract, opposed to something that is uh, a commodity and is replaceable, right? We're not something you go off like the Walmart chef shelf and pick up. This is a yeah. custom piece of art and that shifted everything. And so when you got going and, you know, like you're, you're at the beginning, you know, you've shot a wedding or two. I mean, was this something that you did from the very beginning? Did, did you learn this over time? Did you, or did you find it to be easier, you know, as you had a reel that was, uh, you know, like you you got out of the way, how'd you go from being a typical, just like, Hey, I'm shooting a wedding to being you. <laughs> uh, we, we approached every wedding with the mindset of like, how can we make this as amazing as possible? Mm -hmm. And we start, we, we stopped trying to remove excuses because there is no perfect shoot. And I, I, I lived in that world for years where I thought there would be a perfect shoot. You know, like if only the vows were better or the location or the lighting or the, and it was always, and I'd give myself excuses of why this was okay to be average, you know? And then it was when stop removing those, go, wait a minute, there is no perfect. Like we make it special by how we approach it, how we see it differently. Um, and all of a sudden, the work just was going viral, was getting out there. It'd get posted on wedding forums, stuff like that. We did one um, one wedding in California. And, you know, I was in Canada, so seven hour flight. Um, and this is 13 years ago. So like it wasn't nearly as common that you would fly a, a sure. videographer in from, you know, another country. Um, but we did one wedding and it booked us up for three years with weddings in California because that same day edit and we were right at the, the front of that whole same day edit wave. Um, and that's the kind of stuff showing a really strong story in a same day edit at a wedding. All of a sudden that was booking us all kind of work um, or getting noticed by NFL and, you know, these other companies. But it was it was actually just the work. It was the stories I, I was. We were shooting for Callaway, the golf company, mm -hmm. right? One of the top mm -hmm. golf brands in the world. I'm shooting with Phil Mickelson. Dude's 10 feet to my right. The director walks up and he goes, hey, so you did that wedding film and you had these shots with the groom and as he was getting ready. Can you do that with Phil? I'm like, what? the best golfer in the world right now and you're <laughs> referencing our wedding film and how we should shoot him? Like, it was actually just the quality of, of content yeah. that was getting us out there. Like, there was no marketing. There was no, like, we were so um, inexperienced in any of that. And mm -hmm. we just were so passionate about the work that that's what changed everything. And I think, too, like, I mean, you know, watching your films a decade ago, I mean, most of the industry still isn't caught up to that. And I think just removing those boundaries and challenging yourself, you know, as we're into February, um, you know, moving into the, the next season of weddings, it's like, you know, you kind of like, I want to talk a little bit about like how you communicated to your couples, um, about like, this is how it's going to work. Or, um, like you mentioned about, you know, them picking the soundtrack and, and telling you what color to use. Like, Today, I I am the artist that they're hiring and I've built this brand around me. What did you do to just like um, practically speaking, say, you know, you get to this point where they trust you. What does it look like practically? Like what did you you know, were you doing two or three days of shooting? Were you charging by the hour? What did that just kind of look like with what they were doing um, when you were building that, you know, no boundaries thing? I, I, I think the. It was really about going beyond selling a wedding video and, and stopping selling a wedding video and realizing that we were selling an experience. Mm -hmm. And that experience starts from the first email, the first phone call, what you say to the couple, how you treat them, where you take them, everything matters. And that's what they're paying for more than anything else. Mm -hmm. We all just sell pixels and waveforms. Your pixels might be prettier than mine, right? But like at the end of the day, it's the same thing. What changes is the meaning we impart on it. And we, as the artists, create that meaning. So we did that by changing the language, 
You know, we were cinematographers. We'd show up at a wedding and they would talk about like, oh, the cinematographers are here and the bridesmaids would be like, oh, what, is, what does that even mean? And they'd, oh, well, they're, you know, they're really good at this and that. And, and it, it created a different conversation. You know, we would use premium materials and how we printed things. We had a whole theater in our space that we'd come in and we'd show them and do these screenings. And But we looked at every part of the experience and then we owned the process. And that's a huge thing. We didn't wait for them to tell us what to do. We started implementing a process of this is how it's going to work. This is how this whole thing goes. Um, and we're often afraid to do that. Like we're afraid as, um, as creatives to suggest what's going to happen because we don't want to lose the sale or we don't want to upset anybody. And, you know, we want to make you happy. So like you tell us what you want. Um, but people want to be led. Like when they're hiring you, they want to be led. They want you to drive the process. So we would start telling them, we're going to get to know you and we're going to use what you care about to drive how we approach your story. And when we show up and what we shoot and how we do it, that's all going to be something that comes out of who you guys are. But you don't have to worry about any of that. You don't have to send a shot list. You don't have to think about, you know, soundtrack. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff because we're going to manage everything from start to finish and create a custom piece of art that's kind of based on you. Um, that eventually evolved into the idea of keywords that we use in the Muse process where we'd, we'd come up with keywords and pitch them keywords and go, you know, we get to know them and then give them a series of five keywords as this is how your your film is going to look and feel and what it's about. Um, and, and those, you, you know, what's inspiring, what's different uh, about these people, um, you know, how do we want it to feel, that sort of thing. Uh, but we do this exercise and we present them keywords and they'd be like, uh, Robin and Gary. <laughs> Robin and Gary, a wedding we did in Italy. It was like a 20 or so thousand dollar budget. We're sitting down three days before the wedding and pitching them their keywords going, hey, so here's what, and that would be the only creative thing that we would align on, right? Like we're gonna give you five words and then we decide everything else from there. Um, and we, we gave them the five words and I, I can't recall what they are now. Um, but the bride, uh, Robin actually looked up and was like, I feel like you get us better than we do. Like, do you wanna plan the wedding? Wow. But it was that level of like listening, yeah. right? That like we really get who you are and what you're about. Um, and then you can imagine what that does for trust. Right. And in that same conversation with Robin and Gary, after pitching the keywords, we then realized, well, look, one of our keywords is Polaroid because they gave all of their guests Polaroid cameras. And that needed that to be film. a theme of the, the content. And so we needed to be in their rooms when they get the Polaroid cameras and doing the tours as they're shooting with the Polaroid cameras, all kinds of things that wasn't included in the contract, you know, and it it was a. Ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 additional to have us film a couple more days of all of this stuff. But the decision was like that. Like, go for it. Like, no problem. Because they got the objective. They felt so heard that, like, we were telling a story that was so them. And then we needed more, honestly, <laughs> to, to bring that to life, right? And so it just yeah. made those conversations so easy. But then how we did it or anything else, like, they were happy because they saw how much we got them. And that was it. And then the, the next point would be showing them the wedding. You know, like, we'd be actually showing them the film and we were done. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it really does like take off the walls of what most people are thinking because most people, you know, nowadays, you know, there's the wedding videographers forums on Facebook and there's all these different places to compare yourself to what everybody else is doing. So everybody kind of gets in a line and, you know, they just do what the next person's doing. And I'm guilty of doing that, you know, where it's like, oh, well, okay, now everybody has this drone. So we need to get this drone. And now everybody has this song and this. Okay, cool. This is, you know, what are you doing for your LUTs? What are you doing for... And it becomes so much more about just the stuff than it does the people. And that is like with our brides, you know, I, I adopted that early with keywords and different things to just like, we want to know you. There's only 20 brides a year that we want to pour our entire heart into. And so if you are not that fit, like it, there's almost a freedom to knowing exactly what you want to do and to lead somebody, you know, you're talking about leading people and it's almost relieving when somebody doesn't book me now. It, it, it becomes like, oh, good. Like, if you don't see what value I bring, that's great. Like, you, I, I'm okay with that, you know? And so removing those boundaries um, for people and just getting out of their own way and just saying, like, in a perfect world, what would I do to help tell this story? Instead of just saying, oh, okay, it's Jimmy and Susie's wedding next weekend at this venue. Where's their timeline? Okay, cool. Like you I'm know, just going to show up. I'm just going to shoot it. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have such a fear of missing out. 
a fear of missing out on the contract, a fear of missing out on the shot, a fear of, you know, not having people like us and not thinking it's good enough and all of that kind of stuff. And when we actually, um, when we actually realize that when we start focusing on making content that like we want to watch, that we care about and developing real relationships and being excited, like genuinely excited to just dive in and create something different, which is sure. not how a lot of wedding filmmakers after a no. couple of years, they're, they're burnt out and they, you know, they don't want to go to that next wedding. But when you can approach it that way and create things that genuinely excite you, all of a sudden one wedding can change everything. Like right. JC and Esther, the wedding that went viral and landed us the NFL gig, um, I wasn't even paid to shoot the wedding. Like I was actually there doing a photographer promo and realized the opportunity. But what's so important to get is like, we're so afraid to turn people down or to like stand for what we believe in that we just let people walk all over us and just do what we think we have to do. Yet doing one wedding in the way you believe and, and really putting yourself into it I mean, it landed us a two hundred thousand dollar contract. That's right? not about. That's not about contract. <laughs> and, and it's, but it's, it's so important that like we get instead of taking on the crap that you don't like and doesn't make you come alive, give it away if you have to. But like, make sure it's actually the kind of work you want to you want to do, and the kind of people, and you shoot it and everything, and all of a sudden you can charge two, three times the rates. You know, right. like everything can change, and and that's what I think we forget. We're so worried about you know just keeping up and making our bookings and all of that, that we don't get that things really change when we do something different. And we have to take that that step. We can't wait for this perfect couple to come along, throw all this money on the table and go, hey, you wanna do something different? Mm -hmm. You know, like take charge and create it for yourself. And all of a sudden, I mean, with us, it changed in months. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't a year's thing, you know? And like, I think uh, Nick and I a lot on the podcast will talk about, you know, like building and taking time and using in the crock pot method instead of the microwave method and just taking our time and building relationships with different vendors and different and like to hear that, you know, an Emmy award winning filmmaker was, you know, gave away a wedding film you know, or like did it for free. Like, I think a lot of people see some of us, you know, and compare their second wedding to someone, my 500th wedding or, yeah. um, and to, you know, to know that like the opportunity, like to be more long-term thinking than just like, Oh, well I need to eat this month. It's like, well, what could this story do for you? Like, where could it take you? What could, I mean, you couldn't, couldn't have dreamed in a million years, like that, you know, Oh, let me <laughs> no film way. this wedding. No now way. I'm shooting with <laughs> Phil Mickelson. Okay. Now I'm winning, you know, and it's just yeah. like, obviously the talent had to back it up and you guys are amazing, talented people. But like, I think that the story, I mean, that's what sucks people in. You look at these mm -hmm. viral mm -hmm. videos on Facebook or on Instagram or wherever Twitter. And it's like the things that draw people in these, you know, military w people coming home and, um, you know, these videos, the story is what makes it go. It's not the color grade or the lighting. I mean, yes, those are important, but like, you know, capitalizing on moments that are, if you're thinking about stuff like this, you might realize that the bride's dad had cancer and now he's going to be at the wedding or, you know, or we had a bride at one point where dad wasn't expected to make it to the wedding. He felt way better, made it to the wedding, brought his bride down the aisle. We filmed him seeing her on the, you know, we made the story about dad and between the wedding and the time we finished the edit, he passed away. And like, the bride called me frantically one day and was like, do you have my dad's voice? And I was like, yeah, why? And she said, he passed away this morning. I don't have his voice anywhere. And I was like, oh my goodness. And like d telling that story, even though it didn't get 10 million views or something like that, like that bride till this day, I ran into her at Target and I mean, I filmed her wedding eight years ago. She just like grabbed my hand and was like, thank you. Y you don't understand what that means. I get like choked up talking about it because I'm a dad and it's just like, yeah, what we are doing is very, very important. It's not just a job. And like the stories that we can tell in, you know, in this era in 2019 to be able to know how to use a camera and lights. And I mean, you should never not be booked. <laughs> you should never yeah. not be, you know, telling stories. You mentioned, um, muse storytelling I know still motion was there. Muse is, you know, transitioned. Tell me a little bit. I want to talk just about that, where it's gone to. And I want to talk to the listeners too about you kind of hit on it, but like you guys have developed a storytelling process 
Um, and so like, tell me how it transitioned to Muse, um, that kind of timeline. What is that? And then we can kind of talk a little bit if you, if you're cool with it, just about some of the, the high points of your storytelling process, some of the things that you guys are working on. I'm happy to chat about whatever you would like. Yes. Um, so, you know, at, at its height for still motion, you know, we were doing 40, 50 weddings, started getting into commercial work um, and then started doing education. You know, I, I had a psychology background and I was very interested in teaching and sharing. I mean, that was originally going to be my career. I was going to get a PhD and, you know, teach. Uh, and so I loved that idea of trying to share what I was learning. Um, and so we did a, you know, we launched a workshop called the Evo Experience. Um, no idea what was going to happen. It was $2,500 a seat, 12 seats, and the thing sold out overnight. <laughs> and we're like, oh, wow, we're going to figure out what we're going to do. Like, <laughs> like we got to actually plan, like, this is happening. And I, I can remember doing that first one and really not knowing what I was doing. Like, mm-hmm. like I feel, you know, there was a lot that I didn't know, and it brought to light just how much I didn't know. But I was so driven to always try and find the answers. So we'd show weddings, we'd talk about the work, and people would ask, like, why a steady cam shot? And what is that saying that, like, a slider is not? Or and it'd be like, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you. <laughs> and so I, I would start diving more into the psychology of, of storytelling filmmaking, yeah. right? What, what do all these things mean? Um, but what became clear, we did a whole bunch of 30 city tours with Canon. You know, we did tours across Australia, Southeast Asia, and the thing that came up more than anything that everybody asked about was story. But it was a buzzword. It was a, you know, it was just a phrase people threw around and everybody would talk about how important it is. But then when you brought the conversation to, okay, how do I tell one? Nobody had an answer. And, and it blew me away. Even film schools would have this whole uh, top-down approach. Let's watch a film and then talk about why it works and how the story worked. But it's like, where's the, the bottom up? Like, where's the actual start here and take steps to build a story? Um, and I couldn't find it. And so that's, that's what Muse became. And that's what my journey has been since then is creating a company called Muse Storytelling, which was an exploration of how do we actually create a storytelling process from the ground up that is based in science, that's based in, you know, anthropology, sociology. It looks at Joseph Campbell and a hero of a thousand faces and like, you know, myths and how that story structure relates to Aristotle and his, you know, the way he talks about persuasion and it all comes back to communication and moving people and really being remembered and driving action. Like the principles um, overlap so much. And out of that, we distilled a process. Um, And so originally that was going to be education only. Like we were, we were uh, teaching, we had an online course, we did workshops. Um, But I, I felt like uh, I needed to also be, practice the craft. And so we got back into using the process and leveraging the process for uh, our commercial work. Except all of a sudden now, instead of ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, we were adding zeros to it, yeah. you know, yeah. because the process added value. I mean, if you look at a, a commercial um, on TV and like how how what what is the difference when you ask yourself what's the difference between a company that's paying five hundred thousand dollars for a spot versus five thousand dollars to the local filmmaker you know so much of it is the creative Mm -hmm. it's not the like the filmmaker on the five hundred thousand dollar spot yeah they're getting paid more but they're actually not getting paid that much like they're not doing fifteen thousand dollars a day they're getting twenty five hundred bucks right like the the actual profit and the opportunity is the creative and so that's what we started doing is focusing on the creative part of the process we'd make the film but we would never touch anything unless we were developing the creative so we'd have to do the whole thing Um, and that's what the new storytelling process is is this idea of how do you build a story from a to z how do you guide your clients through that process whether it's a wedding whether it's a commercial film um, so that you're adding so much more value but you also you're no longer the tripod Somebody tells you where to stand, what to shoot, how to do it, because you are taking back control and going, hold on, no, no, no. That's a line on the objective. What do you want from your wedding film, from your commercial film? Now, let me as the storyteller drive us there. Let me get us there and I'll show you the steps I'll take. Um, And that's what's been so exciting because that is it's very empowering. You know, when filmmakers, you, know, you mentioned that you, you know, get to know people and you use keywords and that that becomes very empowering for you. Right. And all of a sudden 
you get more trust and it's easier to book higher rates and everything can change. Uh, and I think that's why I care so much about community and education is because you can unlock uh, a whole new life for people. The, like what they're passionate about, where they right. create work that says something that's remembered. And, you know, you, you walk into this bride at, at Target and like it's still emotional to you because you, you meant something that transcends just that day. And that's our opportunity every time we go out to make art, not fashion. We get stuck in this fashion world of the trends of just opening with the drone shot and doing what everybody's doing. But guess what? That fades so quickly. Um, so I love being able to try and help people to create art that says something. Right. And so Muse Storytelling got going, um, education all over the world. I mean, you're doing all these things. Um I'm sure that over time, after all these conferences and all these workshops, I mean, building this this out, I mean, what does the team look like now for you? I mean, like, um, like what are you guys up to when it comes to like, wh- how can I learn that process from you? What what is the step? You know, what is it? Where's that tangible thing that I can go to and say, yes, I want to learn that. Uh, well, right now that thing is learnstory.org. Uh, and we're actually launching a free training series. And so it's okay. a, a four part series of videos, nearly an hour of content that takes you through all of the best principles of the new storytelling process, how to work with your clients, how to pitch story, how to find a great story, even in boring places. It's all entirely free um, as a way of letting people know if, you know, is does this work for them and do they want to kind of get into the full university level course on Muse. Um, but the hour of content just offers so much value and a sure. really good sense of uh, what this is. And so that's just, uh, you know, add your email, sign up and you get uh, sent to um, a video a day, I believe, um, or over the course of a week. Yeah. It's open for a couple of weeks and each one is 10 to 15 minutes long. And that's that's launching this week uh, is from what I understand from when we're dropping this podcast. It um, is. Yes, yeah. that is live now and that'll be available for two weeks. Look at that. My alarm's going off because it's launching right now. <laughs> uh, Perfect. So, <laughs> sound effects. I have a button for it. <laughs> uh, yes. So it, um, we give it away entirely free, uh, but we do that for two weeks. And that's when then the course launches. And we do uh, awesome. like a course launch model. So it's not something you can buy anytime um, because one of the biggest problems people have is finishing stuff. Sure. They buy it and they never do it. And, and that kills me because I didn't do this to make a little bit more money on the side. Mm-hmm. I did this because I want to actually shift how people tell stories and empower them. So we, we, sh- we create everything in a way that maximizes success, which is more of a course launch model where you've got a couple weeks to sign up, but then you can learn live with us. And we do webinars and we do a lot of ways that you can actually learn with the community. And we set a, a pace you know, where it's like, here's where you should be. Um, and that makes people far more successful. It really increases our completion rate. And yeah. it just means that it makes a difference. Yeah. Is this the is this the same thing as like the university level courses or is it a different thing? I know that I, I'm looking on your site, you know, it's like you can really jump in and get like a full education from you guys now. Is this th- is yeah. this that? Is that yeah, and we, we actually only offer one uh, one main course on story, and it's called The Science of Storytelling. So we have the free training series, and then the bigger course, though, that we offer is The Science of Storytelling. Um, and absolutely, that dives into how story works, how perception, you know, engagement, how do you capture people's attention and move them through your content so they want to stick with it. Um, we've taught this to senior creatives at Apple. Uh, we have taught this to the United Nations in Geneva. Like they flew us in because they're like, look, the <laughs> work incredible. we're doing is world changing. However, it's really boring when we talk about it. Yeah. Like, you like show us, <laughs> yeah, show us how to tell stories, you know, and like highlight of my career, being able to walk into the United Nations in Geneva um, and share these ideas with them to just help them be able to communicate better. Like that's how um, that's how widespread or ubiquitous this kind of communication is, right? Like it can help everywhere and it's not just your videos. Yeah. Like like it, it's not just the content. When you learn to tell your own story to clients, that changes everything, you know? So it's like it's actually learning to become a storyteller yeah. through and through, not being a wedding filmmaker that tells stories. Yeah, because I think a lot of times, too, like as a wedding videographer, and I stopped doing this, like less is way more. I've trimmed everything away from what I'm communicating except for 
this is my story. I'm John. I'm married. I have two little girls. I'm at weddings all the time. And I see dads giving away their daughters. And I, you know, I'm connecting with people. You know, I love the office and I love Taylor Swift and I, you know, I love the Oklahoma city thunder or whatever. Taylor like, Swift. Really? Oh yeah. Huh. We, we can go off. I on never, a I, I never would have guessed that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she's a game changer. I'm a big fan of game changers. Um, but, but she's not the best storyteller. She's really, I mean, if you dive good. into the lyrics, I mean, that's, that's what kind of what gets me, but, but, uh, uh Game okay. changer, I'll give you that. All right, there we go. I, I appreciate her ability to market in a way that nobody had marketed and make yes. a ton of money. So that's why I like her a lot, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Fair, but like, fair. I mean, I am about telling the story of the why I'm doing this to my couples instead of shoving down their throat that I'm shooting on C100 Mark IIs or C200s or using L-series lenses or like they don't care about any of that. They just care. And when I book a bride and when, you know, when I make the most money is whenever, boom, we we've, we've connected. Like when yeah. we are on the same page and they see my passion for them and telling their story. That's, I mean, that's what it all comes down to. I mean, the psychology of it all and everything is just like if you can blow them away with their own story, that is going to potentially lead you to the United Nations of Geneva. <laughs> it is. Um, it is. And if you can blow them away with your story too. Yeah. Your approach, right? Like it's, yeah. it's you know, Seth Godin, one of the, you know, most brilliant authors on marketing and approaching all of this in a different way, talks about how marketing is no longer about the products you make, but the stories you tell. Exactly. And Simon Sinek, who is, you know, a, a visionary in how to really connect people, talks about start with why, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about what you do, it's about why you do it. And like, exactly. that's how, when you're sitting with people, like it's, and it, it takes a while to really get this as like a videographer or a filmmaker, but like, it's not about the pixels. It's not about the gear. It's not about the thing you're making. It's about the meaning you create. And that comes out of your story, yeah. right? Like how much, why you do this, what it's about, what are you trying to create for them? And like stand for something. Like you talk about like your daughter and, and what that means, like stand for something. This is why I do this and what I want to create for you. And yes, you will lose some clients because they're not going to believe in that or want that, but you're going to be able to charge five times more for the ones that book you and you're going to do less work. Yeah, You know, like it, it's, it's simple math. <laughs> it really is. And I mean, the more that I like, so when I first got going, it was kind of like if you had a pulse and wanted me to film your wedding, you were my right? target market. You were the exact target demo for me. And the more that I did weddings, it's like, man, I really didn't, I didn't really like working on that wedding. That one was, they were trying to look like they had money. That was the point of their wedding or this, yeah. you know, I didn't like it. It wasn't about just the money for me after, you know, I've done this. This is our 12th, 13th year doing wedding films. It's like, I've been to, I filmed celebrity weddings. I've filmed, you know, hay bales in the backyard weddings and everywhere <laughs> in between and beach weddings and mountain weddings and Hawaii weddings and Every, every, you know, weddings, all, all kinds. And, you know, the ones that I really, really enjoy are the ones that really care about. They love each other so much. They love their families. They're really, you know, the, the people are what's important more so than the money spent. And like identifying that and realizing that and connecting with those people and preaching to those people on our Instagram and Facebook. And like, this is what's important to us. This is who we are. This is what's important to us. You attract, you attract those kind yep. of people to you that are like, oh my goodness, they, they come into their initial meeting with us and they're like, your daughters are so cute. And I just love that you love Taylor Swift or whatever, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and that's great, you know, whatever. And so, um, and be you. And like, I think that yeah. I was always grow, I always grew up, you know, to be like, I was the second of four kids and it was just like one of these things where do what dad says. And do, you know, like because fall in line and, and not have an opinion and not have, yep, and it yep. was like, wait a sec, it, the more I have an opinion in a healthy way, the more I'm going to attract my ideal clients and the more that I'm going to get these brides. And now 2017 was the first year that I really pushed over to only brides that I loved working with. And it's like, why haven't I been doing this since 2007? Like this is so, so much crazy. happier. Right. Like oh. it's so much more fulfilling. And all of a sudden, like I, I remember lying in bed on Friday night wishing it was Sunday. And there's something really terrible about wishing for your life to be over. 
like not wanting to experience it because you're that unhappy with the work you're doing. And like, I knew something I had to change. And that was yeah. the exact same thing. We can't do weddings just because people have the money or the budget. You know, like we don't want to be shown off as like, look, they can just make pretty things. We want to actually connect and care about the work. Uh, and it, it, it is so important to, to take that step as early as you can because your limits are so much higher. Like in, we create our best work when we're passionate about it. No doubt about it. Like you are going to find new limits when you all of a sudden align your passion with what you're creating versus forgetting about that inner voice or silencing it because it's like, a, I need to pay the mortgage. I need to just do what they want. This yep. is what I saw on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely 100%. Um, as we're kind of wrapping time up here, I want to, I had a couple more questions. Um, we've, we've hit on a lot of advice for people in all different, fa you know, phases of their career, but specifically for somebody that's just getting going, that's stumbled upon this podcast and they're, they're listening and hearing all these things. If you were starting over, you know, in 2019 and your first wedding season was this summer or this, you know, spring, what advice would you give yourself now? Uh, I would I would talk about the fundamentals of storytelling and just trying to explore and get those. And I think I mean it's it's we probably shouldn't talk about story for an hour and not give some tangible tips on how do we actually do that. And I think that's probably the advice that I would give myself is, you know, one understanding the role of character. Like think about the people in your wedding film as characters and try and understand who they are. Um, and two things that really are so important to focus on are one is desire. What do they want? What do they care about? And, and try and use that to drive what you shoot and how you shoot it. So if they love the cake cutting, great, make it a big part of it. If they don't, don't worry about not doing it. Like actually start not focusing on things that they don't care about. But what you'll find is all of a sudden there's this beaten up old RV that they actually care about that wasn't on anybody's radar and you have an incredibly original story. Or you've got, a, you know, the inside of the dress is signed by the aunt that made it because you actually found out what they care about and it's vintage clothing and they had it made. And we don't even know if we don't ask. So what do they actually care about in using that? And the other part is uniqueness. What makes them different? Right. And it can be their backdrop. It can be how they speak. It can be so many different things. But thinking about what they desire and what makes them different and then go through your your itinerary and go, OK, well, what actually shows this? And to the level that we would actually um, get people to send us speeches and we'd read through ceremony programs and highlight, go, "Ooh, this is like this is unique. If, if it's going to be the exact same thing, why are we focused on putting that in? Like that's not their story. But when people all of a sudden talk about who these people really are, what makes them different. That's what we'd highlight and we'd focus on capturing that. So that'd be the first thing is, is really celebrate character, understand what people love, what they desire, what makes them different, and then find moments to highlight that. Start trying to cover that instead of covering That's everything. Huge. You'll love it. You'll add so much more value to them because now they're watching what they love and what makes them special as opposed to what could be their friend's video. Then the other part though, more than just that, comes back to engagement, comes back to plot, how you structure your material. And it takes a long time to really get story structure. Um, but the simplest thing you can do is to try and create a question in your content. Try and create a question early in your story that the audience wants to have answered. That is the, you know, in, in Hollywood films, that's conflict. You watch any show, television show, book, movie, and it starts with somebody dying or getting sick or there's a problem or, you know, the relationship falls apart. And then the rest of the story is the journey to overcome and what happens. That is, in a nutshell, story structure, right? And, and that can be a really hard in a wedding film to kind of get to that level. But the basis of it is a question. So it's, it's starting with the bride opening a present, freaking out that she can't believe what it is, but you don't show it to the viewer. Mm -hmm. So now I want to know, what is it? It starts with the, the, the groom being so nervous about his vows and not sure if he can pull it off. And then you tease that to the end to see if he can do it. Like they don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be big. But when you find ways to create a question, that is how you actually get your viewer so that they want to watch. Um, and all of this, right, character, conflict, thinking about story structure is just about not not going beyond your bride and groom, thinking about a wider audience that might want to watch this. We call it the mailman test. Is this something we could show the mailman? When he comes over to drop off the mail, can I pick up my phone and go, yo, bro, can you check this out? 
And will he watch it and will he be moved? Because that's, if you set that as your standard, it changes everything. We, we forget that like, we often create wedding films just for the couple and we don't really serve them by doing that because we're not really celebrating them. We're not really creating the strongest content and we're not making something that it, when they share it, people are excited and it goes to other people and, and they, they actually engage with it, right? So kind of thinking about how do I create something that the mailman would want to watch by celebrating character, thinking about creating a question uh, is exactly what I tell myself and what I would try and dive into because you can do that with any kind of equipment, with any level of expertise, with lighting, with anything, and you can absolutely charge top rates in the industry if you do that really well because they won't see any of that other technical stuff. They will feel the difference and that's what they'll pay for. Mm. Man. That'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get I'll get off my Apple box now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much more. I mean, you know, having followed you for so long, um, man, there's just so much. Uh, I mean, I'm really excited to check out the learnstory.org. Um, you know, lastly, I guess um, this year, what projects are you working on? Are you doing things besides um, the education? Are you doing any commercial work? What's what's getting you excited? Like what makes you excited to be at work on on Monday instead of regretting to be there? Uh, so we are doing an amazing project with Four Seasons, um, the hospitality company. And Four Seasons has this incredible belief um, in just, you know, creating connections between people, which is very much aligned with why we tell stories. Um, and we helped Four Seasons launch a program called Envoy, which is where artists can uh, apply and they get basically flown to a Four Seasons around the world. They get inspired by doing cultural experiences, you know, scuba diving or hula dancing or whatever happens in that area. Um, and out of that, they just need to create. That's, that's it, the only obligation. So we'll fly you to a five-star resort, give you, like experience the world, and then enter that inspiration, create. Um, and so we get to run that program. So we are helping to choose the envoys and we get to make a film for each one. So we're gonna be going to Egypt soon with this amazing, you know, painter. And like, we're, we're looking at all these different locations and what we can be doing and we'll be going with these artists and then we get to just blow them away with these experiences and then create short stories about how it changed them, what it meant, everything else. So um, it is literally a dream project to travel yes. the world, get to stay in these unbelievable places um, and then collaborate with, you know, unbelievable artists. And like, they pay us to do this. I, I go, <laughs> it blows me away. They could have just been like, hey, you want to do this for free and volunteer? Be like, yeah. yeah, oh, of course we will. You know, but it's like, it's unreal that like that can be my job. Yeah. <laughs> that I get to follow artists and do these things and just tell these really powerful stories. Dude, that is, that's inspiring. I mean, you know, a decade plus of putting in work and just, I'm sure you've worked so much harder than, than most to get to this point. And, you know, I want to remind people that are listening, you know, it's like to end up somewhere like this in a dream job where it's like, I cannot believe I'm getting paid to do what I'm doing. You have to follow what you're passionate about and you have to just remove those boundaries that we talked about and like you have to be pushing the limit of your own creativity and and thinking outside of the box and just like pushing yourself to get better because if you keep doing the same thing you did last year you're going to get the same kind of brides you did last year you're going to get the same kind of work and if you're not putting yourself in that position to be expanding those boundaries you might at the end of your life get to a point where you have regret and that's the the scariest you thing will. of all you is, will. You're not might. You will. Yeah. And, and the regret thing. I mean, you just don't want to end up in that in that position. Man, I wish yeah. we could talk so much more. Um, I know you've got stuff to do. I'm really excited to go check out the LearnStory.org. Where can people find you? Um, where's the best place on social website? Uh, um, yeah. MuseStorytelling.com. Uh, that's where you're going to find our storytelling software, where you'll find our commercial work. And if you want to check that out, um, and that is uh, where you'll find our blog and everything else. And then uh, we're at Muse Storytelling on Instagram, which is where we are the most active. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We'll definitely have to have you back on here. My goodness, our We'd listeners love are to going come back. to love this. And thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Everybody listening in, we appreciate you listening. Be sure to share this, subscribe, and until next time, we'll see you. 
awesome. Ah, so good. <laughs> so good. Yeah, I'm glad you're it. happy. Ah, uh, yeah. 